Welcome to the porch. It's good to be with you guys this evening. Really excited about the message uh, this evening. And I'll start just by talking about a conversation that recently occurred uh, between my wife and I, between Monica and I. I'm often reflecting back to my time in high school, okay, which looked like me talking about, you know, my best friend. Yeah, my best friend and I, my best friend Travis and I, we were there. And then, you know, later on, I'll tell her another story. My best friend Trey and I, you know, and then I'll tell her another story. My best friend Cullen and I, and then I'll tell her another story. I'm like, hey, my, yeah, my best friend Sean and I, well, she starts keeping track. And she's like, hey, why did you have so many best friends? Like, were all these, like, were you just popular? Like, why did you have all these best friends in high school? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't, it wasn't that I was popular. It was that I couldn't keep them. Uh, here's, and I started, like, reflecting on this and kind of had this, like, breakthrough moment. I'm like, oh, no. And, and I realized that I had this, like, explosive anger problem, which would, like, end, you know, there would be these explosions and then it would end a relationship, and then I would move into another friendship or a relationship, dating relationship or friendship, whatever that was, there would be another explosion, and then rather than, you know, figure out what was going on in the midst of that explosion, I would move on to another relationship. And I'll, I'll give you a picture of one, okay? Um, there was a, a summer that I actually worked in a neighboring town, Victoria, if, if you've heard of it, and uh, so I would work there. I worked a courtesy car wash, and rather than drive back and forth uh, I was about 30 minutes away. For the summer, I, I moved in with a, my friend and his mom, and I just lived with them that summer so that I could work there. And so he was my best friend. And uh, some other friends uh, were going to go to Schlitterbahn. If you don't know what that is, it's the closest thing to heaven on this planet. And, <laughs> and so they were going to go to Schlitterbahn, and I wanted to go to Schlitterbahn. And so I, you know, and I invite my, my buddy who I'm living with, hey, you want to go to Schlitterbahn with us, okay? And this is in high school. And uh, I think we were juniors or seniors. And he's like, no, man, I can't, you know, uh, I don't have any, any money. I, I can't afford the, the ticket to get in. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no worries, bro. Dude, you gave me a place. I I'm banking up at Courtesy Car Wash. Dude, I got you, okay? No, you come. I, I, I will pay for your ticket, man. I got you. We, I, this is, and he's like, really, you do that? I was like, yeah, of course, man. You gave me a roof, man. I got you. Let's go. And so we all go to Schlitterbahn, have an amazing time. Okay, uphill water coasters, who knew? It, it was fantastic, this Schlitterbahn. And, and so uh, towards the end of our wonderful time there, I see him go into the gift shop. All right, and, I, and I'm watching. And he comes out of the gift shop, and he's got a new puka shell necklace. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I, I, I bought a necklace. Had a little shark tooth hanging down there in the middle. I was like, say, idiot. I thought you didn't have any money. And he's like, well, I didn't have money for a ticket in. But when I saw this necklace, I couldn't refuse. You know, it's, it's puka shells. And I'm like, no, 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 bro. I paid, I paid for you to get in. And you had money. You're spending it on dumb necklaces. And, and right there in the parking lot of Schlitterbahn, it escalated. And you saw another explosion of JP's anger. And push came to shove, literally. And what happened was I never talked to him again. He, he very literally was like, no, get your stuff out of my house. And I... I, I called, no, no return phone call. I talked to his mom. No, it's done, man. You don't, you don't. I tried to embarrass him in that parking lot, and the truth is I succeeded. And it cost me a friend. And what's crazy, over a shark tooth puka shell necklace. And I saw him years later. Now we're grown men post-college, and we're at a party together, and it's still awkward. Because of a shark tooth necklace. Like, hey man, hey, hey, wife and kids, oh yeah, wife and kids, yeah, yeah. Cool, you doing well? Yeah, you still got the necklace? No, okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, and isn't that what conflict does? Is it causes these explosions in our life that sometimes we don't know exactly how to respond to? See, explosions marked my life and cost me most of the relationships that I had. And you know what the common denominator was? It was me. It was me. 
And so my guess is this evening that some explosions mark your life. And so as we move through this series, Quarter Life Crisis, tonight we're talking about the crisis of conflict. The crisis of conflict. It is fun to watch these explosions from a distance, but it is not fun when you are a part of them. Like, I'll just give weight to what I just said. Uh, I remember when reality TV started, okay? Like, there was no reality TV. Then all of a sudden, there was the real world one. And, and, and it was like watching a train wreck of an explosion. You could not look away. And then all of a sudden, uh, reality TV just exploded, and everybody began to watch it. Why? Because we were entertained by these explosions. In fact, you know what makes reality TV wonderful? Conflict. Constant conflict watching dysfunctional people not work through their problems. And we watch from afar. But the, but the problem is, some of these explosions mark our lives. It marks our career. It marks our relationships. It marks our friendships. It marks families. It, it marks holidays. It marks roommate situations. And if you don't know how to navigate through this, your life will end up looking like one big train wreck, one big explosion with a common denominator of you. And it, you will take it into marriage, you will take it into future seasons, you will take it into parenting. Do you know the number one, I read this, the one of, I'll just say the number one from this particular source, the number one determiner of success in marriage is ability to resolve conflict. As Monica and I meet with people in premarital counseling, uh, they take a test called prepare, the personality kind of profile, and they grade you on your ability to resolve conflict. It's the first thing I look at because I know how hard they're going to work, have to work at marriage based on what that says, their ability to resolve conflict is. What I am going to teach you tonight, friends, I have traveled to Africa to teach the governments there with friends. Presidents, and I'm not exaggerating, presidents of foreign nations have traveled here to this property to learn the very things that I am going to present you with this evening from the scriptures. If you apply this to your life, it will change your life for the better. Okay, this is huge stuff. You have to have this. And so why do we put it in the quarter life crisis series? Because as I look at the crises that people face in their 20s and 30s so often, right at the center of it is an interpersonal conflict, an inability to get along with someone, a roommate, someone that has hurt you, a parent, a coworker, a boss, and we have to understand what the scriptures say to this. So we've covered career, crisis of career, money crisis, selfie crisis, singleness crisis, authority crisis. Tonight, we are going to talk about conflict crisis, which affects every relationship you have. And the path that I want to take you down this evening through the scriptures is a change in perspective. I want to give you a new perspective of conflict. Uh, in the middle, my second point will be a part to own. We're going to talk about your part in the conflict. And before you leave here this evening, I want to present to you a, a very practical path to peace, a, a path you can walk in to pursue peace. And so I'm going to be all throughout the scriptures. The Bible has a whole lot to say about this, but I will camp primarily in Matthew 5 if you want to turn there. It's the first book of the New Testament, uh, chapter 5. I'll also be in chapter 7 and eventually chapter 18. Uh, I will be in Ephesians 4. But if you just want to turn to one place, you can go to Matthew 5. It's the Sermon on the Mount. It is uh, the, the greatest sermon ever preached. It was preached by King Jesus. And, and here he says in chapter 5, verse 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Jesus is referencing the Old Testament Ten Commandments, the commandments that were given to Moses as he came down from the mountain that were written with the finger of God. One of them was, thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not murder. Jesus is saying to the people, hey, you've heard it said as he's preaching his sermon, hey, you guys know you're not supposed to murder. And so here at the porch today, 2014, we're nodding our head like, yeah, man, you just just don't kill people. That's not good. We don't kill people. Okay. As followers of Jesus, we don't do that. That's like low hanging fruit. Got it. Don't kill people. Okay. So man, that's good. We're passing that test. And then Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who, uh oh, is angry, uh oh, with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 
Okay, so I, I know I'm not supposed to kill, but if I get angry, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, or, or which just literally translates worthless. So you're, you're giving them a degrading term. You're trying to embarrass them. You're trying to make them feel less than human or less than you. Anyone who says this is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Whoa, Jesus. Okay, I got like, okay, so don't take a gun, put it in someone's head, pull the trigger. Okay, got that. You're telling me if I call somebody a fool, I'm in danger of the fires of hell? That, that if there's anger in my heart, that I might be in, the danger, in dangers of hell? Jesus is talking about a state of being. You walk around just angry, it can be evidence that you do not have his spirit. Jesus is telling you something very important. Your anger is an opportunity. It is an opportunity to be, to be given to that you would respond with anger, or it is an opportunity to uh, honor God in the way that you handle or control your anger. He's talking about a response to anger. He says, hey, if you call someone a fool or you internalize that emotion, maybe you don't say it, but you think it. He says, you, you're guilty of murder. You're guilty of an offense as grave as murder. And so being a Christ follower is retraining our response to anger by yielding to God's spirit. It is dependence that he wants from us. And so our problem, your and my problem this evening, is that we see conflict as an opportunity to display our anger. Oh, yeah, you want to do that? Oh, yeah? Oh, you want to buy that shark tooth necklace? Oh, it's like that, huh? Oh, no, I'm going to show her. Oh, I'm going to show him. I'm going to tell Oh, I got a word for him. And that's just not how followers of Jesus respond. Conflict is not an opportunity to display your anger. Conflict is an opportunity to bring our anger under the Spirit's control. And so my first point this evening is I want to talk about a perspective to change. I want to change your perspective of the way that you see conflict. I want you this evening to begin to see conflict as an opportunity to show whose you are. Better said, to show who you belong to. Conflict is your greatest opportunity to, to show the world who is in control of you. Who is your master? Who is your father? Let me show you from the scriptures. It's same chapter, verse 9, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Who, who, who's children of God? Who is called God's children? The peacemakers. You want to look like God, like in the same way that my kids resemble a, a lot of me, okay? I'm in the freakishly weird tall category, okay? There's like normal tall, and then there's weirdo tall. I'm in the weirdo tall category. So my little girl in first grade, she's also in the weirdo tall category, okay? I can say that. I'm her daddy. Those kids say that. It's going to be conflict. Um, but in the same way that she looks like me, we look like God in the way that we make peace, not fake peace. The scripture's not calling you to be a peace faker, someone who suppresses their anger. It's there, but you just don't let the world see it. You, you think you're not going to show the world. And, and not, it doesn't call you to be a peace breaker. These are people who walk around and there's just explosions everywhere. I can't wait to show you how angry I am. Oh, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Oh, Yeah. You just kind of have that attitude like, oh, oh, you want to do that? I'm going to get the best of me. And you know them. Don't nudge them right now. I see some of you. I'm going look down when I said that. It's safe. And, and so some of our greatest opportunities as believers to display our faith and display who our God is is conflict. Like, we may not face real persecution in this day and age. Uh, we may not get the opportunity to, to show our faith in the midst of someone wanting to cut our head off or putting, in, putting us in prison. But in the midst of conflict, you have an incredible opportunity to show who your God is. And so all healthy relationships are marked by conflict. That might blow your mind. But all healthy relationships are marked by conflict. I hear all the time, man, we have a great relationship. We never have conflict. That's not a relationship. That's not a real relation. I mean, one of two things. Either it's a very new relationship or it's a very surface level relationship. But healthy relationships in this fallen world 
have conflict. That's just a fact. But unresolved conflict marks the lives of unhealthy people. If you go around and there is unresolved conflict, there are these explosions that have not been mended, that marks the life of an unhealthy person. So let me just say this to you, that hard conversations are not fun. If you're here and you're a peace faker, I know that hard conversations are not fun. They are also not optional. Okay, It's not something that you can choose not to do as a follower of Jesus. It is an opportunity that you cannot pass up. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says it like this. Make every effort, maybe yours says, be diligent at, work hard at, keeping the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is what we do. See, anger drives a wedge between us, but we work hard to close that chasm. We work hard to close that gap between brothers and sisters or our peers. Whenever you are angry, this is what I want you to think about of your anger. Your anger is like a warning sign. Your anger is telling you, it is a bright red flashing light telling you there is a conflict to resolve. When you see that bright red flashing light, you can respond a number of ways. It's just like a warning light on your dashboard. Okay, you're driving down the road, you know, your temperature light goes off or something goes off telling you something, your check engine light telling you something is wrong with the car. You can respond to that in a number of ways. One, you can ignore it. Two, you, you can fix the wrong things. You can go after the wrong things. And so if you're in anger, you're like, I'm going to show them, or I want to win, or I want to show them how right I am, or how wrong they are. These are the wrong things. You're responding out of the flesh, or you can respond in the Spirit and say, I want to fix this. I want to, dependent on God's Spirit, bring peace here. I want to resolve this conflict. And so what does it look like to respond in the Spirit? It looks like being eager uh, by keeping short accounts, like not letting the sun go down. Why? Why would you be eager to resolve to close that gap? Because that's someone Jesus died for. I mean, that's, someone's God's, that's someone God made. That's one of his, the scriptures say, that's one of his masterpieces. A child of God whom you have a problem with. God desires you to pursue peace. Ephesians 4, verse 26 says, In your anger, do not sin. So as your anger, anger is the warning sign. In that anger, do not sin. Respond in the spirit, not in the flesh. And do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Be eager to close that gap. Be eager to pursue reconciliation. Matthew 5 now, back in the scripture, says it like this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. What is going on here? This is in the old time, if we were seeking, or in this day, the first century, if we were seeking God's forgiveness, we might bring a, a, a offering to the altar saying, God, would you forgive me? Here's a sin offering. And God's saying, hey, I don't want your sin offering until you've asked their forgiveness. You take that. You leave that there, but you run now. It says run and go and be reconciled to your brother. If someone has something against you, you run. Do you know what this means? This is what this means. Some of you shouldn't be here next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, you need to be on a plane flying home saying, hey, man, I forgive you for buying that shark tooth necklace. Oh, that's just me. But, but some of you have something, right? There's someone that, that has something against you. And you know it. You're sitting here, and you're like, man, I know. Man, I, I know that I did that. I did that the wrong way. I know I should have never said that to them. Man, they don't know the God that I worship. They don't know that I'm a child of the creator of the heavens and the earth. Man, I need to go and sit in front of them and ask their forgiveness. It's like stop singing Shane and Shane songs. Stop singing worship and run and being reconciled to your brother. Like, don't, don't sing, don't, hey, God, I love you. No, 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 run. And say, I'm so sorry. I, I've been worshiping God in vain because I realize there's been an infraction here that I haven't mended, and you have this against me. And so this is the part to own. My second point this evening is a part to own. And so what is the part you need to own, and it's simply this, it's your part. You have to own your part. If you, let me say this, if you are a part of the conflict, you have a part in the conflict. 
And it's really hard to get your mind around because you might be sitting there like, no, you don't understand. They dated my ex. You know, they, they slept with them while I was dating or they used my toothbrush without asking me or they said something about me behind my back. They ruined your name. I don't care if they walked up and they punched you in the face, okay? You determine, hey, what is my mind to own? Maybe you sinned in your anger. Maybe you had a conversation in the car. Oh, yeah, you want to do that? I can't wait to... Maybe you're just sitting there getting all worked up in the shower. No one else is there, but you're just having this dialogue, like going back and forth. And you can start with that. Hey, you know what? You know what? Before we go any further, I just want you to know, man, I've been having this conversation with you in my head. I've called you some really ugly things. No one else heard me. But I, I, up here, I've been saying some awful things about you, and I want to ask your forgiveness for that. That does not display who's, who is my God. You start there. Okay? Hey, I, I want to start by owning my part in this conflict. But the problem is anger blinds you. When you are angry, you can't see your part. You can only see their part. You, you can only see their part. And so what happens is you want to lash out. But before you lash out, I want you to look inward. When you see that bright red flashing signal, okay, instead of lashing out, you look inward and say, hey, what is my part in this? What is my part in this? Because when you start begin to escalate in your mind and in your heart, you sinned already. You're already in sin. You already have something that you can own, and you can start right there. Let me read to you from the scriptures. It's Matthew 7, verse 3. In porch. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank of wood, a two, two by four sitting in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, anger, when you're angry, you can't, you can't see their faults. You, I mean, you can't see your own faults. You can only see their faults. You can't see the two by four sticking out of your forehead. You can only see the flake of sawdust in their eye. And so you have something to own. And the challenge here from the scriptures is for you to find it. Stop thinking about what they did and start thinking about what you did. Okay. And so what does that look like for me in Schlitterbahn? It looks like, hey, bro. Man, I know I, I, I paid your way in and I want to ask your forgiveness because there were clearly strings attached to that ticket. I had some expectations that I did not express to you that you did not meet. My expectations upon you is that you would not have spent any money because you told me you didn't have money for the ticket. And that's an unfair expectation because I never told you that. So much of your conflict is an unmet expectation. So much of the conflict that you experience is some expectation that you put on someone else that they did not meet for you. And so you can start there. Hey, I had an expectation of you that was not fair. It was not fair and that I did not express it to you. It was not clear that that was my expectation. You never agreed to meet that expectation. And I'm sorry, but not only am I sorry, will you forgive me? There is power in those three words. Will, four words. Will you forgive me? Okay? <laughs> Learn those four words. Will you forgive me? Not I want to ask your forgiveness. Good, I'm glad you want to. Do it. Not, I'm sorry, you are sorry. Yes, you are. <laughs> Will you forgive me? Will you please forgive me? Five words now. <laughs> it's funny when, when you're a student in high school, you know, those relationships, they just seem different. There's a different depth there. But man, I was a believer. I was on staff at a church teaching the word of God my best buddy was also on staff at a church, senior pastor. He discipled me. We sat down. We went through systematic theology together. We met once a week. We traveled together. We, we vacationed together. A really, really, really dear friend of mine I had placed on a pedestal in my life as someone who had discipled me and shepherded me, someone who I really looked up to. And in the midst of that, he began to make some decisions, specifically financial decisions that I began to question. And in one particular phone call, this is my best friend, as I'm questioning these decisions as an adult, as grown men, I began to, to call him things. 
And so I believe to this day that questioning those decisions was the right thing. Now, he wasn't doing anything, he wasn't stealing money. I just didn't think he was spending it wisely as a pastor. I, I didn't think he was above reproach in what he was doing. And so what I told him in, in a moment of, ex, of explosive anger is I said, it's like you're a prosperity preacher. Those words came out of my mouth. To which the phone call ended which I did not talk to him again for years. And I pursued him, and I texted him, and I wrote him letters, and I called him, and I left him voicemails, and I begged his forgiveness on voicemails. I told him I was sorry. I said it was a moment of anger. But again, this explosion had cost me a relationship now that, that as a, an adult hurt very badly. Very bad, and, and I began to resent him. How could he write us off that fast? Like clearly I was delusioned in what I thought the friendship we had was. That he could just end it like that. Like are you serious? Like you're just gonna go your separate ways? Like show me that in the Bible. Where is that in? Make, you know, be diligent in preserving the unity of the spirit in the body of peace. Haven't you taught that? Haven't you stood up here and preached that message? Where is that in Matthew 18, Matthew 5, Matthew 7? And that's what was going on in my heart. And what did that do? It just drove the wedge bigger and bigger and bigger. I continued to call. I continued to text. I continued to write. To which one text he responded and said, I will meet. God brought him back to Dallas. We met. Sat there. And the first thing I said, I said, bro, Thank you for meeting me. Will you please forgive me? When I, I said that, I, I said exactly this. I know what I said. I should not have said that. I, I, uh, I spoke from a place of anger. And will you please forgive me? To which he said, well, I didn't expect that. Which was odd to me because I had said that so many times via text, via email, via, via phone. And I said, well, again, will you please forgive me? To which he said, Yes, I forgive you. And then he said, I think you're waiting for me to ask your forgiveness. I said, you know what, bro, I forgive you. I no longer hold any debt that you've caused in my life against you. And he said, I'm not ready to ask that yet. I said, you don't need to. And so many would say, hey, that wasn't peace. That didn't look like peace. You know what, I got in the car and I had peace, man. Because as long as it was up to me, I lived at peace with my brother. And that's it. You focus on your part, on your part. And by the Spirit of God will give you strength to move on, to step forward. You focus on what you can do. It doesn't always go well, but as long as it is up to you, the Scripture says, you live at peace with your brother, being diligent at preserving the unity of the Spirit of the bond of peace, making every effort to do so. And says in verse 25, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. This is Matthew, verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still on the way to, to court, as you're still on the way. And it goes on to say, or else there will be greater consequences. The consequences will grow. The consequences will escalate. Settle matters quickly. Now what's interesting is when people are on their way to court, they're not thinking about settling the matter. They're thinking about winning. That's whenever somebody goes to court, they're thinking about, hey, I want to win. I want to show them. I want to get the best of them. And the scripture says, no, you are not concerned with winning because when you're concerned with winning in conflict, you lose. Let me say that again. When you are concerned with winning in conflict, you've already lost. Okay, this is the, the mark, this is a mark of a mature believer. You are not concerned with winning, you are concerned with peace, which is different. You are not concerned with being right, because then you're already wrong. You're concerned with pursuing and preserving peace. On the way to the matter, being eager, being diligent. Here's what I want to show you, that conflict is a crossroad. When, when you are in conflict with someone, you are at a Y. There are two directions you can go. You can move towards a broken relationship. You can cause a fraction which grows over time. Okay, it just gets weirder and awkward. You can pretend it's more awkward. You can pretend like it's not there, but it is. Or you can take the path of peace. 
the path that is worthy to pursue the path of peace. That's my third point this evening, a path to pursue. The path to pursue is peace. And so I'm going to walk you through a very practical verse. I want you to turn there, Matthew 18, in your Bibles. I want you to underline this. I want you to circle it. This is something you want to know and live by. It is a process we call the Matthew 18 process or Matthew 18 principle. And here it is, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, step two, take one or two brothers along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, step three, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to even the church, step four, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And so it starts out, step one, let's go now slowly through this. I'm going to camp on step one for just a minute because most conflicts are resolved right here at step one. If your brother sins against you or your sister sins against you, if you feel anger towards someone, okay, you go to that someone without talking to anyone else. You go directly to them and say, I am here to resolve this conflict. And so should you pursue every conflict? Is it everything wrong? If they put a door ding in your car or, you know, uh, accidentally stepped on your toe, do you pursue every conflict that way? No, you don't. The scriptures say that it is uh, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is one's glory to overlook an offense. So if you can overlook an offense, you should. How do I know if I can overlook offense? Because you can. If you, if you can you know, move on and, and not think about it, not have the conversation in your head, then you can overlook it. Let me, let me tell you like this. When I eat something bad, it begins to gurgle in my stomach. I know, usually, I know if that's going to go away and I'm going to be okay or if that's coming back up. Like if it just doesn't sit right, like I eat something, it just doesn't sit right. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, as long as it just doesn't sit right, you know. I, I usually know, man, I'm going to be all right or no, no, no. This is coming back up. And conflict is the same way. You sit there and you're like, oh, yeah, you know what, I, I think I can overlook that. Or you know what, man, I'm going to have conversations in my head. I'm going to get in the car, I'm going to get spun up. I I think this is going to come back up in my life. I think I'm going to continue to think about this. And so just be eager then before the sun sets, run and be reconciled to brother. Leave your gift there. Run to them. Hey, when you did this, it hurt me. Can I just tell you something? When you said that, it hurt me. I heard this and it hurt me. And I want to give you the opportunity to bring clarity to it. Maybe what I heard wasn't true. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. Can we talk about this? Because I heard it and it hurt me. And so should you talk to someone else? Like sometimes it looks like, hey, hey Shane, let me, let me talk to you for a second. Man, David, man, David the other day did this. And I, man, I just don't know. Man, like should I go back and tell him about that? I mean, I just don't know if I should or if I shouldn't, you know. And I just was thinking because I, I couldn't believe he said that. Okay, is, is it okay? I'm just, I just want to vet this with you. No, I just want to talk to you for a second. I just want, I just want some wise counsel. Hey, will you just pray for me and David? Because David did this really stupid thing the other day. Will you just pray about, is, is that okay? No, 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 no. What you just did is you just invited someone else. In. So, so if somebody comes to you and says, hey, can I just talk to you for a second? Man, stupid over there did something stupid because that's what stupid does, right? And, and I just, you know, would you just pray for stupid? Uh, and, and I'm not talking about David now, David. I'm, we're not stupid. But would you just pray for stupid because, because I, I just can't believe it. And you know what? You need to say, oh, you know what, man? Hey, you need to go talk to stupid. Uh, because what you just did is you just painted my picture of them. You just influenced my perception of them. And, and man, I, I didn't ask for that. And so, you know, you need to go talk to them. And by the way, if, if you don't, I will. So we, oh, no, no, I'll talk to them When? Man, I, just when I see him, I'll talk to him. No, no, how about this? Uh, because you came to me with eagerness, how about you go to them with eagerness? How about I say 24 hours? How about I call them tomorrow, and I'm going to ask them if you've talked to them? And if you haven't, then I'm going to tell them. I'm going to say, hey, this is what you said. It's just so I'm clean. You know what that does? It makes this a really unsafe place for gossip. Can I just tell you something? This is a really unsafe place for gossip. Because now you've all been trained to do that. Somebody comes to you, hey, man, you wouldn't believe what stupid did. Oh, man, I, I don't want to believe it, and let's just go talk to stupid right now. Okay? And, and could you imagine if the church was a really unsafe place for gossip? Hey, you need to help make the church a really unsafe place for gossip. Hey, you have 24 hours. 
you go and you be eager before the sun sets, it says. Before the sun goes down, you go and you tell them. And so if they refuse, now, step two, if they listen to you, awesome, praise God, right? You're there, you're trying to seek to understand, you don't know everything, you don't know everything that went on, so you go there all by yourself, hey, you run to them, hey, when you did this, it hurt me, I want to give you the benefit of that, I want to seek to understand why you did that. Would you, I, I want to understand why you did that. That's step one, okay? And if they listen to you, you've won them over, praise God. If they don't, then you, you go and you invite somebody back in. And so when you go to step one, you've now stepped in the ring, not to fight, but to work out the conflict. So this ring right now represents the area of which we're going to resolve the conflict. Now what I don't do is I don't carry the conflict outside the ring. I don't go and circle up people, okay? I don't conspire against you. No, we're going, if we're gonna fight, quote unquote, we're gonna fight in the ring. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and grab somebody else and I'm gonna bring them in the ring with you. And if there's other people, the only people who are going to be in the ring is people who are part of the problem or a part of the solution. Nobody else. I don't need to vet. I don't need to get wise counsel. I don't need to, to think about it. I don't need to have prayer requests. Okay. I'm going to bring anybody who I think is a part of the solution into this room and we're going to work through it. So now I'm leaving. Hey, you didn't listen. So I'm leaving and I'm going to go find some others. Hey, listen, so-and-so and I are in a conflict. Would you please come with me as I go back to them? And talk, I'm now at stage two of Matthew 18 principle. Would you please go with me and allow and just kind of mediate and observe? And if there's anything in me that I'm missing, would you show me that? Hey, would you come? Now, you bring one or two people with you back into the circle. And you tell them, hey, I want to tell you again. When you purchased that necklace, it hurt me. And here's why. Here's my part in it. I'm eager to come to you. I want to keep short accounts. I want to overlook uh, a small offense. But this, I've just been sitting on. It hasn't sit well with me. I want to tell you again. And now somebody's watching. And if they say, hey, man, no, what, man get out of here. I don't want to work it out. Now, you leave and you get the church. Someone in a position of authority in the church, you say, hey, would you guys come with me and mediate this conversation? I'm now at step three of Matthew 18 principle, and I need to tell them now. And this is why we talked about last week, it's so important to be under the authority of the church. So now, your brother or sister who has sinned against you, you bring the church into that conversation, you step into the place where you're going to resolve the conflict with the church, and you say, hey, I want to present this to you again. You have hurt me. And I mean you do this every time. And you got to be sitting out there like, does this really happen? 80% of what our staff does is that. So you want to know, you know, if you're tithing to church, if it's going to good uh, resources as, as it pays our salaries, 80% of what we do as a staff is resolve conflict. Is that time well spent? You better believe it is because the scripture says work hard at preserving the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so 80% of what we do as a staff is resolve conflict, which means 100% of what we do as a staff is make disciples. Because we're showing you how to yield to the spirit. When you are angry as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a greater force within you that is God. God is going with you. And God will help you not to give in to that anger or display that anger, but to bring that anger under his control so that he can do something righteous. This, if you apply it to your life, it will save your relationships. It will change your life. It will save your marriage. It will change the way you parent and everything moving forward. This simple, and you do this every time. Every time it's necessary. And so then, step four. If they refuse to listen to the church now, you treat them as you would a pagan, which is just a word for a non-believer, someone who is not a Christian. You treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, some of you are like, oh yeah, now here we go. Like a pagan. No, 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 no. How do we treat pagans? We love them. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? He loved them. Okay? We treat them wisely. We, we understand that they are not controlled by the same spirit that we are. And so we may not partner with them in business. 
Uh, we may not be in a position where we let them hurt us again, so we treat them wisely. Okay, And then thirdly, and most importantly, we share the gospel with them. We assume they do not know our God, and so we tell them, hey, do you know the God who has resolved all conflict? Do, do you, know, like God, you know how God resolved conflict? Did he hold what you did against him? Have you done anything against God? Let me ask again, because have you done anything against God? Oh my goodness, nod your head up and down. Have you done anything against God? Friends, you have done a lot against God. If you don't think so, then you've got self-righteousness against God, okay? You, you've got grave sins against God. Do you know how he handled those? He said, I'll pay for them. I no longer hold your sins against you. This is how I resolve conflict. My son dies and washes away all of your sins. I show you that I can defeat death so that you can be with me forever. I will do anything. I will go to great lengths to close the chasm of conflict between us including sending my only son to die for your sins so that you can be with me forever. This is the gospel. And that is what you represent as you move towards somebody who has hurt you. Hey, I'm not going to let you keep hurting me, okay? But I want you to know my God. Can I tell you what he's done for you? And at step four, you share the gospel. Peace is so powerful, man. Can you imagine being able to move and insert peace into any situation. It's so counterintuitive to respond towards peace when you're angry. But a fruit of the Spirit is, is peace. It's what the Spirit produces inside of us. And so in summary, a new perspective is to see conflict as an opportunity. This starts with you owning your part, being eager, owning your part and overlooking small offenses. And, and, the, and thirdly, the path that you pursue is outlined here in Matthew 18. Know it. Uh, tell it, preach it, live according to it. In, in this, man, I, I've seen wives sit before a woman who slept with their husband and forgive them, yielded to the Spirit. I've seen husbands talk to wives who cheated on them and, and forgive them, and vice versa. I've seen crazy situations. I've seen those who were abused sexually sit in front of their abuser and say, I forgive you by the power of God that lives in me. I am no longer at conflict with you. There will, I will no longer carry this burden, this weight with me throughout my life. This dark cloud will no longer exist over me. I forgive you. But I will tell you that some of the most amazing conflict resolutions I've seen are simply roommates that just got into it and hated each other. I'm talking just young adults or friends that just got sideways and one just exploded in anger and caused a deep hurt, which caused them to cause another deep hurt, deep hurt, deep hurt, back and forth. And now there's just this huge chasm and they come together and one person yielded to the spirit of God who responds bigger and says, I no longer want to hurt you in the same way that God forgave my hurts in Christ. I want to forgive you. This is what I believe my part is in this. Will you please forgive me first and foremost before we go any further for my part in this? And I have seen God do incredible things when people respond to conflict in how they were trained. I want, to wa I want you to watch a video. We'll end with this. It's a, a video a friend showed me this week of, of an explosion that, that was caused by someone else. And I want you to, to see how someone responded and so watch closely watch their first response and then their second response and I want you to listen to what is said about them if you would watch this I want you to hear that I want you to hear that he, he started out at first he responded as a victim he ran from the explosion. He didn't want anything to do with the explosion. When you, uh, and when you experience the explosion of conflict, you feel like a victim. Man, something has been done to me. I've been hurt. I'm a victim. But then it says his training kicked in. And so then, after you realize, hey, I'm not a victim, man, I am a child of God, I'm a peacemaker, I'm blessed by God whom I'm going to be with forever because of his purchasing me through the blood of Jesus Christ, I now, him with me, we have the power to go and bring peace to this situation. Your training kicks in, and you run back to that situation, and you say, you know what, I want to bring resolve to this explosion. I want to save you and save me and save our relationship from this explosion. 
Let me ask you a question. Anybody watch that and think, man, what an idiot. Some drunk guy hit the thing. Anybody think he was drunk? I'll confess to you. I watched that the first time. I'm like, dude, he must have been a drunk guy. And then you find out it's a 70-year-old man in diabetic shock, and you feel stupid. <laughs> and, and it's just like conflict. We assume we know everything. Oh, I assume I know why that explosion caused. And then you go there and you're like, oh, man. Oh, you thought I said that? Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm so sorry. Will you please forgive me? That is not what I meant that's not what I meant to say. That's not how I meant to represent myself. This is what I meant. We think we know everything. We think we're so smart. Hey, God wants you to work hard at pursuing peace. But can I tell you something? As we sing this song and the chains and the band are going to come up, and th- there are people in your life that, that you need to forgive. And, and, and as we worship together, you need to know who those people are. And then some of you, man, some of you, you need to leave quietly during this song and you need to go and pursue peace as someone has something against you. And you need to run to them before the sun sets and you need to go and beg their forgiveness. You know that they have a grievance against you. You might need to purchase a plane ticket. You might need to go get a bus fare or something, but you need to go and be reconciled to your brother. My prayer for the rest of us and really all of us is that we would live according to these principles. That peace would mark our life. You would no longer take pride in being bad or angry. or You would now be controlled by the Spirit of God. Because if you are given to anger, it is a mark that the Spirit may not be, it is a mark that the Spirit's not in you. I'll just say it like that. It's like Jesus says it. Okay? It's something worthy of thinking about. Let me pray. Father, we love you and just thank you that you love us enough to tell us these truths. Tell us how we can be with you forever through your grace, your pursuit of us as we have a conflict against you. You ran after us and you chased us because you love us. That's what I pray my friends would know right now, how they are loved by you. And Lord, some of us, we're scared to death because we we feel right now that there's someone we're supposed to pursue reconciliation with and we're supposed to mend this relationship and we're like, how can we do that? And would you remind them that you will go with them? That you're going to go with them into that explosion. That you're going to protect them from that explosion. You're going to give them the words to say in the midst of that explosion. Father, thank you that you are always with us. You say that you will never leave us and you will not forsake us. Father, thank you that you have closed the chasm between you and us. In Jesus' name. I think for a lot of us this evening, the only thing that you need to hear, or I'll say the biggest thing you need to hear, is just that God has closed the gap between you and him. He's closed the chasm. And he did that with the death and the resurrection of his son. You've got to be here asking him, why did Jesus have to die? Maybe you're wrestling with who God is. I mean, start with Jesus. 2014 years ago, something happened to reset time. It started over. Why did he have to die? He had to die so that you and God could be in relationship again. Because your sin was between you and God. And that sin went on Jesus. Jesus died. He paid the penalty. He paid the consequence. He paid the price for that sin so that you can be God's again, so that you can be his child, so that you can be with him forever. You're not going to be with him forever because you're good. You're not going to be with him forever because you read the Bible or you prayed a lot or you were in a small group or member of a church. You're going to be with him forever because Jesus Christ died for you and raised from the dead. You need to know that. If you don't know that, we'd love to wrestle with that truth with you. Or if you have questions about that, we'd love to talk to you every single week. Praise God, someone has questions about that and it is our greatest joy and honor to talk with you about those questions. And so please come up here, we'd, we'd love to do that, okay?